Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, Nancy Birdsall, the president of the Center for Global Development, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to what I think is going to be really a stimulating lecture and stimulating discussion of the lecture. Um, Arvind Subramanian and Pradip Mehta are both, well, they're amongst my favorites for being thought-provoking in a, in a courageous way. Um, I'm not going to, I think you have their bios, is that right? You have their bios, so I'm not going to review their degrees and their awards and their history of uh, work in some of the world's finest global institutions. Instead, I just want to introduce first Arvind. After he talks, I'll introduce Pradeep. So I want to say about Arvind that um, amongst the senior fellows at the Center for Global Development, I think of Arvind as uh, one of the courageous, creative, and fun guys. And his lecture, although I haven't looked at it carefully, I'm hoping that it is an interesting follow-up for those of you who came to the Sabbath lecture given by Danny Roderick a couple of weeks ago, in which Danny Roderick was emphasizing for Africa the issue of premature development. Um, Arvin's lecture has in it the title, Precocious Development. The second thing I want to say about Arvin is I kind of wanted him as one, I've been trying to get him to do this lecture for some time. He is the head of our India Initiative, and he has been the host for a series of lectures on understanding India that has included Frank Fukuyama, uh, uh, Ramachandran Guha, and Rukmini Banerjee. And I've wanted him to do a lecture himself. It hasn't been easy to kind of corral him into doing it. He felt rather modest, unusually, about doing a lecture. And I think he finally agreed when he knew he could have Pradeep Mehta be the discussant. Um, so I'm looking forward to what happens next. Let me ask Arvin to come right away to the stage, to the podium. I've actually lost my lecture. <laughs> Have I, I? I thought I. Oh, you, you, yeah, you probably took it, Nancy. <laughs> uh, first of all, let me say what a, a yeah, yeah. pleasure it is to be here, um, and I, I, I thank you all for coming. Um, it's true that uh, you know this has been some time in, in, in the making, and uh, I'm glad Nancy was uh, insistent. Um, so it's it's a particular honor to be here because I have uh, uh, Pratap as as the discussant, and uh, you know I, I'm going to be saying some um, you know hopefully some new and different things, and uh, you know I, there's no one better than all of you, of course, and Pratap to to bounce these off and to kind of. Uh, um, uh, you know, kind of have uh, have be challenged by, and um, so you know. Before I begin, uh, this is I'm not doing this strategically, but uh, you know, part of this is going to be a little bit about uh, democracy in India and so on, and, and its economic consequences. And I want to say that you know, uh, if there is one absolutely spectacular piece on democracy in India. It's Pratap's book, uh, The Burden of Democracy. So uh, I would urge all of you to you know, just uh, read it. Uh, I've, to be honest, I've read it about seven to eight times, o only two or three of those because of amnesia. And you know, I have to go back to that. But the remaining because I've wanted to and I've re read it. So some of what I'm going to be saying, you will see, will be a kind of rechanneling of Pratap's Burden of Democracy. Yeah? Um, so, so as you know, there are many ways to think about India. You know, you can say lots of things and everyone, you know, and, and there are lots of ways of saying things about India as well. But what I'm going to do is to adopt um, a kind of perspective of, you know, how can we understand change in India? And here, if, if you think about it, you know, call them the three L's of change. Um, you know, there's luck, uh, leaders, uh, and, and legacies. Um, so I'm not going to be talking a whole lot about uh, any of these, 
Partly because, you know, honestly, there's not, I mean, I don't know, I don't have much to say on these things. Um, and if you think about this, when you push economists, you know, uh, why things happen, why things happen, finally, they are kind of pushed to something like this. And that's why I think uh, uh, Bob Solo famously said that, you know, all discussions of economic, you know, economics begin with great rigor and end in a blaze of amateur sociology. So, 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 so this is kind of, you know, uh, and partly it's because, you know, you, you end up like this. Uh, and and I, I want to, in fact, focus on, on, on a fourth L of change, what I call linkages, and, you know, not I call, but what Hirschman called linkages. And I've been rereading Hirschman uh, a, a lot. And the sense that I come away with his famous book, Strategies of Economic Development, and the notion of linkages, is really a way of trying to understand the one thing that we can understand. So it's a bit like the light under the lamppost syndrome. It's not that these things are unimportant. I think it's just that we can understand these things better. And I think the concept of linkages is about you know, understanding uh, or, or organic or, or endogenous change. So here's a quick kind of roadmap. Uh, I'm going to go through the what I call the precocious development model. And then I'm going to go through a little bit, you know, the positives and negatives of these linkages, these orga organically generated changes, from the perspective of, you know, uh, growth, macroeconomic stability in institutions. And then I want to end up by asking, you know, what really matters for change uh, in, in India? So I I'm going to uh, uh, begin by advancing the, 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 the kind of uh, controversial proposition that if you look at uh, models of development uh, around the world, I mean, India is uh, an absolutely special, may, may not be unique, unique, but very, very unusual uh, in, in two senses. The first is uh, in the economic sense. Now, uh, the way I like to characterize modes of escape from development, I, I think there are, if you look at the broad pattern of history over the last 200 years, there have been three modes of escape from underdevelopment, which I call geology, geography, and genes. Uh, genes being manufacturing, a code word for manufacturing. And of course, you know, geology is resource-based growth. Uh, geography is kind of tourism and stuff like that. And then the predominant manufacturing mode, you know. Uh, to be cute about it, you could say geology, geography, and genes. But you wanted to go back, extend the genes going back. It's the Gini that basically the cotton Gini was the manufacturing approach to development uh, for the, uh, in the 1800s. Um, now, India is very unusual. It defies that pattern because it is not one of these modes of escape from underdevelopment. Uh, we all know it specializes in rich countries' comparative advantage, and that's why you see the services line there going off the chart. Um, uh, and the way one should think about this, I think, is not services qua services, but you know, specializing in com what should be India's comparative disadvantage. India is specializing in its disadvantage, which is skills. You know, skills are meant to be scarce in poor countries. And, and, and for me, this is kind of the best illustration of that. This is you know, India's exports of FDI, uh, which is very high. And if you think about it, it's doing that at kind of 8% of the per capita GDP of the United States. So very, very early on, it's exporting FDI. And the really unusual thing is that China exports a lot of FDI too, but this is a country that exports FDI not in resources, but in manufacturing and services, and to countries much richer than itself. So this is uphill flow of skills uh, embodied in FDI. Um, and this is what I think, so this is the, uh, the economic aspect of you know, the precocious development model. And then we have the political counterpart of this, which is that you know, India has had and sustained democracy at unusually low levels of income. You can see this is democracy against income, and India is literally off the charts, and in the face of substantial social cleavages. If I'm not wrong, I think the only country that has started and maintained a democracy uh, at lower levels than India is actually Botswana. It started in 66 when it's per capita GDP about 370. India started about $800 per capita. Uh, and, and now I'm going to talk about these two aspects, the precocious economic and the precocious uh, politics. What has it done? What kind of endogenous changes has it generated? I'm going to speak about you know, the positive aspects of these change. I think we forget when we talk about India as a poor country, lament what's happening now, that actually this model has delivered, I mean, it's pretty amazing, 35 years of growth of 4.5% per capita. Now, in the post-war period, actually not post, in the, in the entire, uh, uh, since about 1870, 
Only four uninterrupted democracies have done better. And I will, you know, Marla has put up the charts. But by the way, I should begin by saying um, a lot of this is based on joint work with uh, Amrit Amirapu, uh, my, uh, my colleague Martin Kessler, discussions with Josh Feldman, with Pratap, and, and several others who are not in the room. So I should have started. And, and the PowerPoint has been made by Marla. So uh, I, I should have acknowledged this right in front. My apologies. Um, so, so only four uninterrupted democracies have done better. And the other countries that have done better, all non-democratic, about 17 or 18 of them, they were either oil producers or countries recovering after World War II or the Asian manufacturing tigers. Now, this 4.5% per capita means that over a generation, standards of living uh, increase sixfold. So, you know, despite all this Hindu growth rate and India as a laggard, I think it's worth keeping this in perspective that has been actually quite an amazing uh, growth record. The other very unusual thing is that we think of India as a closed economy. Actually, it turns out that if you control for India's size and the fact that big countries actually trade less and that India is a poor country, India is actually an overtrader. Despite being a manufacturing laggard, its trade to GDP is much greater than, uh, it, it, than it should, given its size and level of development. So that's another kind of uh, unusual positive change from this. Now, the other, I think, really important aspect of this endogenous change from the growth and the pattern of growth that's come about, I think it relates to a, a paradox that Sen, Amartya Sen identified, and actually that Pratap discusses in his book as well, is the paradox of you know, why educational attainment in India has been very poor for such a long time. You know? and, and of course, we, uh, the standard answer was uh, you know, the state was not very good at providing this. But then what happened was that once growth took off, this endogenous demand for education and for a particular type of education rose because this was skill-based growth. You know, in the late 90s and 2000s in India, you could go anywhere in India, any city, and say, you know, uh, enroll to, get, to have computer service, uh, literacy in computing, enroll for education, and so on. So this endogenous human capital formation has been so... At the end of the day, even if everything goes wrong with India going forward, the fact that this dynamic has been generated is going to be very important, very powerful. Uh, and I think, you know, if, if, you, if, you look, uh, if you recall the work of Andre Schleifer and the debates with Ace Moglu, Johnson, Robinson, is it institution or human capital uh, as a determinant of long-run development? It doesn't matter, but human capital is a big determinant. And this growth, you know, this is not the best kind of human capital. It's not your thing. But the point is that compared to the past, when the supply of education was poor and couldn't do anything, the, the, the demand for education went up and overwhelmed uh, anything that the, the state could or could not do, uh, leading to uh, you know, uh, acquisition of skills, which I think is a, is a very powerful development. Um, the other positive change, you know, I don't want to dwell too much on this, is the fact that we do now have a dynamic private sector, and it's also, in fact, filling in, partially compensating for public sector deficiencies. This is based on work by Karthik Muladharan and Michael Kramer, which basically shows that you know, the private sector in primary education has been filling in exactly where the public sector has been shambolic uh, in delivering education. Um, uh, finally, uh, oh, not finally, the, the other very positive that thing that's happened, of course, is that growth, democracy, and decentralization have, again, endogenously generated this you know, competition between states dynamic in India. So going forward, I think, and I'm going to come back to this at the end, this is kind of a positive endogenous source of change in India, uh, which will, you know, and this is uh, the, the picture there you see is the nano car, and the lady on the left was the one who's responsible for pushing this car project out of West Bengal. Uh, and then, of course, Modi on the right said, uh, you know, and there were many, many other states that were willing to uh, take the investment, which was initially spurned by the state of West Bengal. In, in the old India, this never used to happen. And, but in the, in the kind of new India, this kind of powerful dynamic has been set up. And, and this is happening kind of across, across the board. Uh, uh, the last point I, I want to mention is not completely related to this talk. Uh, it's based on uh, some excellent work by Devesh Kapoor and Lant Pritchett, who actually show that over 20 years, the kind of social upheavals positive that have taken place uh, in terms of the, the status of the Dalits, the so-called untouchables in India, has been pretty amazing. You know, over 20 years, uh, and these are not just economic indicators. These are, you know, markers of social status. You know, do the other guys eat with you? Do they come and, you know, birth your, ch uh, your children, et cetera, et cetera. And over 20 years, you know, really phenomenal change. Uh, and Devesh says, you know, uh, 
uh, what Europe took centuries to do, uh, um, India may have done in isolated um, uh, sectors, parts, uh, and for selected groups uh, over a very short period of time. So, so I mean, and, and this has been due to the fact of growth and the churning combined with democratic politics and, and so on. So, uh, you know, there's been, again, this endogenous political change, social change, which I think uh, shouldn't be sneezed at at all. But of course, there is a, a darker side to this, and I want to run through a few of them. And one is, you know, relates to what Nancy said and what Danny's been saying, that, you know, this global phenomenon of early deindustrialization, i.e. countries on average are doing less manufacturing and are doing uh, and are starting to deindustrialize earlier in the development process. And you see that in spades in India. And this is based on work uh, I, I'm doing with, a, with Amrit, a PhD student at Boston University. You know, it almost dignifies what's happening in India to say it's deindustrialization because India never industrialized in the first place to deindustrialize. As you can see, the peak share of value added in manufacturing is like 17%. And if you take Brazil or China or, or Indonesia or Malaysia or Taiwan or South Korea, I mean, this was, you know, 35 as much as 40. And India from, you know, the, 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 the low teens has started deindustrializing. And... Uh, I mean, the, the amazing thing in this is, is not just that India as a whole is deindustrializing. It turns out that even the poorer states, which you know did even less manufacturing, are deindustrializing even earlier. So, for example, I, I just did this um, back of, of the envelope cal calculation. Uttar Pradesh is India's most populous state, uh, 200 million people. My wife's state as well, and there. It has started deindustrializing. Uh, the peak share was something like 12% of GDP, which is, you know, very low, and deindustrializing. And it started deindustrializing at about $1,200 per capita GDP in, in the latest PPP numbers that the World Bank has come out. Uh, just for comparison, uh, I, I think um, the average country in the cross section started deindustrializing about $12,000. So this is happening very, very early. Um, uh, uh, and historically, there have not been many cases of countries actually reversing these uh, processes of, of deindustrialization. So this is very much a, 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 the downside of India's precocious model. You emphasize skills, you emphasize services, uh, and in some ways, manufacturing and registered manufacturing has been uh, the liability, uh, uh, yeah, the, uh, the casualty of this. I want to move to now a part of you know understanding India, which has been really new to me, and you know, I, I, and I've been struck by uh, my own ignorance, and you know how much I mean at all the interesting things that are taking place, and this relates to you know the precocious politics and, and macro and, and its macroeconomic uh, component, something that you know Nancy and I have spoken about extensively as well. So it turns out that. As Indian politics started becoming more contestable is when you see uh, spending as a share of GDP rising and deficits increasing in India. So in some ways, democratic contestability, which is you know, around the mid to late 1970s when uh, the Congress party loses its hold of power, uh, its monopoly on power, much more decentralization towards the regional parties. I mean, when politics starts becoming competitive is when you see these kind of um, things happening. Um, Second, and, and I, I would say that this is perhaps, you know, for me, the, the, the biggest revelation for me, and I've learned a, a lot just, uh, you know, putting together this chart and thinking about it. You know, what this shows is today India spends about 27% of GDP government spending. The question is, at what point in time did the Western democracies spend the equivalent amount? At what point in time in development time? And it turns out that, you know, uh, India is doing this amount of spending very early in its, in its history. So I think there are three things that come out of this, I think, to me. One, it is not surprising that a poor country, an unequal country, and a cleavage-written country would have these demands on the state to spend. So, 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 and this is not something that one should kind of say is, is an undesirable thing. It's just something that's, uh, I think, inevitable. But it's happening at a time when the fiscal capacity of India is, is, is not there because it's doing it uh, very early. The implementation capacity is not there because we have, this is, you know, when you're doing it so early on, state capacity is, is weak. And very important is the point that Indira Rajaraman of the National Institute of Public Finance in India makes, which is that, I mean, I'm showing total spending, but if you were to do this in terms of how much of this is pure redistribution, 
it's probably the case that India is also doing this very early. And that's very important because if you look at the history of Western democracies, redistribution comes very late in the process. In some ways, redistribution comes only after the legitimacy of the state in providing public goods, public services is, is kind of established, and then redistribution becomes much easier. Of course, redistribution also related to uh, World War II, but, but, but the welfare state and things came pretty late, later on. And so, so, so India is in a situation where it's having to do, these, uh, uh, do this redistribution and spending at a time when the state, um, you know, the legitimacy of the state, even in providing these public services, is kind of not there uh, completely. Now, that's on the spending side. But when you put that together with, I know Nancy will, will, will like this chart. This is, you know, this shows uh, what I've calculated is the share of individual income taxpayers in the adult population. So I call this the taxpayer to voter ratio. Um, look, it's stuck at 5%. Uh, if you think that there's no representation without taxation, and in some ways that's the fiscal concomitant of, of a democracy, the social contract where uh, you know, people, citizens have a stake and a say uh, in the state via paying direct taxes, then 60 years on into a democracy, this is just very, very low. Uh, this is also a point that Pratap makes uh, in his book. So, so you know, in, in some ways this is a kind of a consequence of the precocious uh, India phenomenon, where you know you have universal political franchise, but insufficient economic stake. So it's like you you have universal suffrage, but not enough stake. You have franchise, but you don't have citizens holding government's feet to the fire. So this disjunction between India as a political democracy and as an economic democracy is really very striking. And so, you know, this raises all sorts of questions about, you know, when you talk about state capacity, its decline. I mean, if this accountability mechanism is not working, uh, then I think this raises a number of questions. So this, so this combination of, you know, uh, spending on the one side uh, at very early levels of income and the accountability mechanism on the tax side being missing, I think is really very important when you think about India as a, as, as a, you know, uh, as a democracy and India as an economy. Now, one consequence of that, of course, is that, you know, India used to be a place where you had a lot of stability. You know, uh, we always used to say that, you know, the Hindu growth rate was a Hindu growth rate, but, you know, we had, you know, sound money, the Victorian virtues of sound money and fiscal prudence. And you know, this is a chart which shows Indian inflation. It's been high, you know, on and off. But what's been remarkable is that Indian inflation was never higher than that in the rest of the world, and that's consistently happened in the last five years. Uh, so, so, so this is a very new development. You know, high, uh, uh, you know, much bigger macroeconomic instability than in other countries. You know, in a kind of repudiation of India's kind of virtuous uh, past. So, so the way I like to characterize this, you know, uh, I say this without, uh, with, uh, you know, with all due respect uh, to Latin America, I, I call this the, the Latinization of Indian, I mean, I, I say this with due respect because Latin America, at least the Pacific Latin America has moved on. Uh, you know, Atlantic Latin America is, is in a different state. But essentially now, India has become a very vulnerable macroeconomy, high deficits, high inflation, combined with this increasing reliance on foreign capital. It's just another, you know, macroeconomically vulnerable emerging market economy. In, 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 and, and just as an aside, it didn't have to have to be this way, but this is the... So, so, so one paradox, of course, is that, you know, we have prematurely big government as a kind of source of vulnerability because, you know, the fiscal deficits, so on feeding inflation. But, you know, when you integrate, you need even more government to protect citizens against volatility. So this is the kind of Danny Roderick point, open economies need bigger governments. So this creates this you know, tension in India now. You're macroeconomically vulnerable, you know, a lot of spending, big deficits, but actually in some ways you think about it, it's become more volatile, uh, you need more of this. Um, final point I want to stress is you know, how growth itself has been putting a stress on institutions. You know, one of the things that people don't realize is that you know, uh, you know, the big scandals of the last five, ten years, you know, the corruption scandals. I mean, you know, of course, corrupt politicians, venal politicians, all of that is there. But there is a sense in which what has happened is that growth itself has generated endogenous rents. You know, uh, these, I mean, I call them ethereal, terrestrial, and subterranean rents to refer to spec the spectrum scandal, the land scandal, and the coal scandal. Um, but all of these, in a sense, have become much more valuable because of growth. 
Uh, and so the rents have gone up, the pie has gone up, uh, and that's stressed Indian institutions. And of course, there are many other ways that uh, this pattern of growth has also stressed uh, Indian institutions. You know, uh, inequality has been aggravated, the allocation of talent to the public sector, and, and so on. And, and you know, uh, Pratap has uh, written a, a lot on these things. Um, so uh, I've taken up a, a lot of time, and, and I want to look ahead, uh, you know, just for, for a couple of minutes. When you think about India looking ahead, you know, you can say, well, Modi is coming to power. Should he do infrastructure? Should he do manufacturing? You know, gender, services, and you know, and you can talk on and on about India. But if you want to ask, you know, what really matters? What really matters? What are the kind of deep forces, endogenous forces for change going forward? Because there will be a world and a life in India after Modi as well. So you know, so the question is, what happens uh, afterwards? And you know, I, I often say that you know, the, the great uh, you know postmodern philosopher was right in, in one sense. You know, Donald Rumsfeld said that you go to bat with the with the with the, with the institution or with the, with the democracy you have, not with you know with the, with the system you have, not with the system you wish you had. And, and, and in some sense, you know, India is you know democracy has to be you know change has to come from from within uh, within democracy and through democracy, and. Uh, I want to read out the last line of, of, of Pratap's book here, which says basically that the peculiar dignity of democracy is that it at least gives us an opportunity to try and exercise our choices as citizens. I, I mean, I, I, I wish he'd had it that it's not only the dignity of democracy, but you know, one of the few things we have in India as a democracy that people get to exercise their choices as citizens. And here I want to uh, identify two uh, choices of Indian citizens in two ways, as political agents and as economic agents, and these being the, you know, the, the deep uh, determinants of change. The first is that, you know, this is, uh, I think, the one hope for India has to be, possibly, is that politics becomes much more responsive. Um, and this is work by Milan Vaishnav, where he shows that, you know, the change in seat share, it's, it's kind of, it, it's kind of, was not related to economic growth uh, in the 80s, not in the 90s, but suddenly it has become in the 2000s. So in, in that sense, if you think about it, this is really very, very hopeful because this says that, you know, finally people are going to exercise their choice as political citizens in favor of, you know, better policies. I mean, I, I don't want to overdo this because this is all still very early. You know, it only applies to growth. This needs to extend to, you know, governance, public good provision, uh, and so on. So in some ways, the significance of the, of the elections ongoing is the fact that, you know, we're going to see a test of this. Um, you know, uh, the, the big uh, election uh, um, subject debate is not about identity or politics or so on. It's about, you know, delivering on governance, delivering on growth, reducing inflation. So all the things that you hope a, a responsive democracy would would, would uh, have, I, I think India is is uh, is kind of showing nascent signs of moving in that direction. And in some ways, you know, you know whether India will do manufacturing or services, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, in some sense, that's really unimportant compared to you know if there are these positive forces for change uh, via democracy, via responsive politics, and via decentralization. Then you know you get this competition between states dynamic, and you get you know um, uh, politicians a little bit more accountable and responsive to, to you know, the real concerns of people. So in some ways, I see this as a cautiously optimistic, but you know, endogenous, deep endogenous force for change uh, in India. The other is, so, so the citizen as politic political agent, and the other is the citizen as the economic agent. You know, I have recently been really struck by, it's been true, but I've, I've been thinking about this much more, is that, this is China, and this shows what it shows is that growth compared to the initial level of per capita GDP. And across the provinces, you know, China has been converging big time. You know, this was true in the United States and Japan. And if, if, if any of you get to read Peter Hessler's trilogy on China, you know why this is happening. 250 million Chinese on the move as economic agents looking in search, seek, you know, seeking better jobs, you know, and voting with their feet in, in, in some ways. We've seen that in spades in China, so we see convergence. So people as economic agents bringing about change, we see that in China. It's exactly the opposite in India. After this is, and, and both these are during the, the, the reform era. I'm not even going back from 1950 or 1952. 
um, where the picture would look much worse. So faster states, uh, poorer, poorer states are growing faster, and, and therefore this convergence. In India, I, I think uh, uh, you know, that's not been happening. Uh, I've even looked at the very, very recent charts, uh, numbers, because some very poor states have done very well recently, Bihar, but it just isn't there. So in some ways, if you think about you know, the force for change through people moving, voting with their feet and saying, if governance is bad here, I move elsewhere in search of better jobs, that dynamic, uh, so even the competition between states dynamic is yet to manifest itself in this powerful uh, uh, force for change. So. Uh, you know, so bottom line is that, you know, a lot going on, a lot to be hopeful about, but in some ways also, you know, a, a lot remains to be done. And, you know, the good news is that people as, as political agents are acting, and I'm hoping more and more that people as political uh, uh, economic agents will also act more, and then, you know, the peculiar dignity of democracy can then uh, work itself out, not just in the political realm, but also in the economic realm. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arvind, as I promised, thought-provoking. Um, well, Arvind kind of introduced Pratap by saying how pleased he was to have him here. And I am too. Pratap, for those of you who don't know, is the head, among other many things, he's the president of the Center for Policy Research in Delhi, which is, in our view, the finest think tank <laughs> uh, in India. Um, as I referred to earlier, he's got lots of awards. He's been professor at many fine, world-class universities. Um, but I think he's best known here, at least in my mind, and obviously in Arvind's mind, as uh, a public intellectual who has thought deeply about democracy, obviously. Uh, Arvind held up Ratop's book and about the links between uh, politics and economic change. So we're very privileged to have the opportunity to hear from Pratap. I should say as well that I was privileged because he was the discussant for a paper I did about a year ago, and his discussion of my paper certainly enriched greatly the next version of the paper. Um, so. Pratap, we look forward to your enrichment of Arvind's theses. Thanks, uh, Nancy and Arvind, for your extraordinary generosity. Um, what I'll do in the next 10 minutes or so, uh, I mean, I'll kind of stipulate that I agree with most of what Arvind says. Uh, 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 and, you know, kind of, um, I'm at a disadvantage because it's easy for an economist to be an amateur sociologist. It's very hard for a non-economist to be an amateur economist. <laughs> but, I, but, but, but I will try. Uh, and the opening I will take for that is um, um, by doing an exercise Albert Hirschman always used to suggest we do whenever we think about economics. Um, uh, he said once in conversation that, if any assertion is made, try and also see if the opposite could be true. Okay? It's almost a kind of Rashomon effect, right? And I think at this particular conjuncture, it's very important to do that. And I'm saying this partly because uh, you know Arvind is so extraordinarily influential, and rightly so. I mean, you know, amongst kind of if you had to pick your economist to kind of take as your guide, you couldn't do uh, 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 better better than Ar uh, 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 Arvind. Uh, but I think it's worth thinking about the conditions under which the claims Arvind has been making would come to fruition, right? So I'll just make sort of three sets of remarks. One is I'll kind of try and run through Arvind's specific arguments in about five. I'll just pick one or two and kind of see what happens if we actually turn the argument on its head. Does it look equally plausible? Then just make one or two methodological remarks and then sort of close with, you know, sort of where had been left or sort of where is Indian democracy headed. So the Rashomon effect, um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll put up a slide in a second, sorry. Uh, 
is there a, can I move to the next? Oh, sorry. <laughs> there you go. So th this is actually, I, I'll just kind of put it up uh, just as a kind of background. This is from some joint work I'm doing with Michael Walton about thinking about the political economy of change in India. And one of the things Michael and I have been a little bit dissatisfied with in the existing political economy literature, which will join with kind of Arvind's argument, is there are a lot of theories. There's a lot of ensemble of statistics, but there's very little attention to mechanisms, which is a very, very different thing. In fact, one of the things I think the Indian development debate went so horribly long in the last 20 years, right, is a certain kind of rhetorical use of statistical data, right? And in one very specific way, which I do want to highlight because we are in a group of economists and I think we need to think about how we overcome this problem. The specific problem, methodological problem, is the following, right? So if you say something like, India's trade over GDP ratio is 60%, this is precocious, this is out of line. Or you take up any other proposition, India has reached a savings rate of 35%, therefore it can do East Asian level growth rates, right? Now, that kind of proposition does two things. It's both an empirical description, right? But it is also the construction of a reality and a claim about what is normal and abnormal in an economy, right? One of the reasons Indian policymaking went so horribly wrong the last few years was we bought into all these normalization constructions, right? So, and, and this I think is a slight disagreement I have with, with, with Arvind. So if we say, for example, that India is spending more than any other country at any equivalent level of expenditure. I mean, that's right, and, and you know, I, think, I think it's a very important point to make and understand what its dynamics are. But what does this proposition actually mean, right? It could turn out, it's possible, right, that India is so far behind in education that if we don't do massive catch up, we will not meet any of the other objectives, right? So that all these statistical formalisms have to be, in a sense, linked to some objective and some theory of change. So if somebody says, you know, 6% spending on health or education is very high for India, let's say for argument's sake, it's an argument. High in relation to what? And there the relevant argument can't be and shouldn't be high in relation to a historical average. The relevant argument should be, is it high in relation to what we need to, to do now to get on a growth path, right? And I think that analysis we are, we are seeing less and less of in, 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 in some ways. And, you know, so, 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 I mean, Arvind, I think this is something I think we have to kind of think about. Uh, it's true, you know, we can, we can do a comparison with the 1880s United States, but the fact is time itself makes a difference, right? Uh, but a lot of reasoning in India, as you know, has become like that. We said, well, countries with 35% savings rate grow at 8%. Grow at Boom, law of nature, nothing else we need to do, you know, right? So I think there is a way in which economics is beginning to actually construct a reality and cognitive maps of elites. And we have to think very hard about whether those cognitive maps uh, I mean, they themselves are causal factors in that development story, right? Okay. Uh, so we have to be careful about what conclusions we draw from any description of reality, because it's, as I said, it's both a description and it's constructing a claim that it's abnormal to export 60% or it's abnormal to spend more, right? And I'm, I'm beginning to be very cautious about, you know, what the implications of those claims are. Okay? Now, the Rashomon effect, let's kind of just play this game out a second, right? So when I look at Arvind's slides, I'm honestly torn, and I don't know how to settle the empirical argument between the two con contradictory impulses I have. I look at the outbound FDI slide, and you could say India is being precocious, it has skills, it's acquiring companies and services, high tech. I also see capital flight. Okay, which from a development point of view is a, is, 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 is a much more depressing story. The same, the same slide, right? 
I see India's export of IT services, but the fact of the matter is that the Indian companies actually did not do very much to penetrate the Indian market. In fact, the irony is that IBM actually is a much bigger player in Indian domestic IT services than Infosys or Wipro TCS, right? What is that telling you? Now, how do I take that trend, outbound and FDI? Should I interpret it as a sign of precociousness, or should I interpret it as Benjamin the Benjamin Button story, a maturing economy that is actually regressing in its fundamentals? Okay. Uh, let's take the education story that Arvind uh, uh, talked about, and 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 as I said, I'm, I'm kind of genuinely undecided. Um, I'll just kind of skip this. I'll just show you two or three charts on education, which will illustrate the point. Uh, Sorry, I seem to have. Uh, I think I lost. Okay, so I'll just make the point uh, quickly. If uh, okay, okay, right. So here's one of my favorite charts on education, which is education completion rates in India, secondary and post secondary, and it's both an encouraging and a disturbing story. This is by age cohort, right? So the encouraging story is female enrollments and completion rates have risen dramatically. In fact, most of the gains in education have come from increase in female. It's really a dramatic story, actually. On the other hand, you can look at this chart and worry, why has the male attainment rate post-secondary education remained almost stagnant for about 20 years, right? What's going on here? I, 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 I don't know. Take another chart, which is Arvind pointed to it, which is the explosion of private schools. Right? So there's private in, in, in urban areas, even private in rural is kind of sort of catching up. Right? Now, I look at this, these two figures, and I can conclude the following. I can say, you know, private investment in skill development is going up. Great story. Or I can say, I'm not, I'm, for the moment, I'm putting, putting aside Lant's objection that the quality of education is so low, the PISA scores are abysmal, this enrollment doesn't. Let's, let's for the moment bracket that. Or I could say, you know, what we are beginning to see is one of the biggest secessions of the middle class from the Indian state that you can imagine. Uh, I have data, I won't sort of show it to you, but on any measure, right, health expenditure, education, transport, private security, water provision, right? In historical terms, the most unprecedented exit from state provisioning that you see, right? Is this a good story or a bad story? From a political point, economy point of view, this is a disastrous story. It's a disastrous story because you cannot think of a single developmental state Right? including the United States of America, which is basically, you know, which we forget was decentralized suburban socialism in some ways for all its anti-socialist rhetoric, right? You cannot think of a single state that can gain political legitimacy and capacity without a middle class engagement through basic services, right? Yeah. Uh, so to me, you know, what, what to economists is looking like encouraging phenomenon. If you're an investor, this is great. I mean, you can invest in private schools, you can invest in private transport. Even the bottom 10 decile is apparently buying motorcycles according to NSS data, great stuff, right? On the other end, you look at the data and say, what, that, what does that tell you? That tells you public transport ain't happening, not going to happen, right? So you could end up in a potentially vicious cycle, right, of, Low tax base, even poorer services. Therefore, as Hirschman would say, the exit option. And if the exit option takes place, it perpetuates this vicious cycle. If I were to characterize one worry I have about India, I think, at this moment, is that I think we are just on the cusp of that. It could go either way. We could retrieve this, right? And certainly, more middle class engagement in politics is a good thing, all of those things, right? But we can take Arvind's data itself and see it as a bad news story, right? So that, that and, 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 and I think the question is, as Hirschman would say, what are the conditions under which it can go one way or the other? It's not just the fact that there is a kind of, you know, 
a sort of a, a, a statistical correlation between some normality or, 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 or the other. Um, the second example, I'll, I'll give it this because I think it has been on everybody's minds. And I, again, I don't know where we are poised on this one. And this is, again, the Benjamin Button phenomenon, which is, let's be very clear. Societies that do well, right, historically, they have lots of attributes. I mean, you know, lots of background conditions uh, um, uh, and, and so forth. I'll just go to the say, first chart. Oh, it's the right. This one. I mean, you know, you have to make the right policy choices, which have to dovetail with institutional designs. Global forces have to be propitious, all of this stuff. But most societies that have done well or emerged out of crisis have, A, got some good cognitive maps about where they wanted to go, right? And, and this is one of the most under-researched areas in economics. How do elites come to an understanding of what they think needs to be done in an economy? Just to give you a facetious example, if when Rahul Gandhi says, the poor don't eat roads, that statement is absolutely true, right? But it is also displaying a certain kind of cognitive map about priorities in an economy. How do elites come to have those cognitive maps? Two, no society has flourished without some minimal degree of elite cohesion, right? I mean, and sometimes that cohesion comes from because there are pressures from the bottom and so forth, right? But some degree of elite cohesion and a capacity to domesticate dissent, right? And creating structures of negotiation that when the kinds of populist breakdown pressures come, you can actually negotiate your way out of that. The question is, is India in such a situation? Does it have enough elite consensus around a workable cognitive map about where to go? Right? What would that look like? Frankly, a lot of it has been post facto. You know, we, we, we sort of tried liberalization, getting prices, and, and, and most of that was, was important. Now, infrastructure is the big thing. That's going to be the global mantra for the next 10 years, from Larry Summers to Justin Lin to Narendra Modi. Everybody is going to talk about constructing the you know, making the world into a giant construction project, right? And sounds plausible, but how is it going to be embedded in, in, you know, in a sense, these other things? But the worry I have on the infrastructure side, which is the following. Um, most people agree India's slowdown is in part a slowdown of the falling public investment, particularly in infrastructure. Uh, India's I code has been falling, TF uh, total um, productivity has been falling, largely because of these large stuck infrastructure projects. So your I code is, is diminishing. And many argue that that has happened because of crony capitalism, there was a backlash, decisions are not being taken. But there is a bigger structural problem. The Latin Americanization of India, again, with all due apologies, there's the macroeconomic side, but there is also the side which is unprecedented, that there are seven or eight companies in India, right, which can collectively blackmail the government in critical sectors of the economy, including infrastructure, roads, and so on. Not even seven or eight, maybe four or five, right? None of those companies is market resilient, okay? If you were to expose Tata Iron Ore, or Reliance's infrastructure investments to market forces, or our infrastructure road projects to market forces, market prices, rule-based capitalism, none of them would survive. Okay, that's a fact. Okay. They got caught out on this one, right? So you had the banking crisis. We have a deep banking crisis, as Arvind knows, right? Not just because of non-performing assets, um, uh, but basically all that banks have been doing Right? is not promoting business lending. They have been basically been blackmailed by five or six companies, the highest credit concentration in the world. Right? Now the question is, if after 60 years of the evolution of business state relations, we are still in such a situation where we are vulnerable to such blackmail by big capital, and, and just to give an example, and again, not to put him on the spot, but you know, Vikram Mehta just wrote a piece uh, a couple of weeks ago, essentially saying, if the new government doesn't sit down with big capital, we'll all walk away, right? 
politically, it was actually a very misjudged piece. I mean, that's not how you argue for capitalism. What you argue for capitalism is we want rules-based capitalism. But the fact of the matter is we are stuck there. Our macroeconomic views are also partly because we are stuck there, right? You have these companies with high debt. The way the government, in a sense, protects them is by external commercial borrowing and so forth, right? So the big question is, will this vicious circle of business state relations, right, which is crucial in any evolving economy, be brokered. Um, the US made the transition from the Gilded Age to the, to, to, to the Progressive Age. What were the conditions? A new ideology around which there was some degree of elite consensus, contested, obviously, it will be, right? Okay. A new regulatory framework that moved towards a more rules-based capitalism and busting up standard oil and all of that stuff, right? Uh, are we in a position that that transition is going to take place? I'm not sure we are talking about the right things yet. I think right now the, 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 the mood is basically, well, the government takes some decisions and we'll get on with it, right? Somehow you get public investment up, that'll get growth up and so forth. But to my mind, I think that's the transition I'd like to see economists help us think about, right? Uh, because institutionally, that's, that's one dimension in which we actually regressed rather than, rather than progressed. I'll just end there, and then we can open up. The... So that was great. I think we should start by giving our things. A few minutes, if you want, Arvin, to comment on anything that Pratap said. Uh, just, just on, just one or two uh, small points. I, I think that um, you know maybe there's a misunderstanding around the word precocious because yeah. I wanted to use it as a descriptive, not as a, as a, as, a, as, a, as a kind of triumphalist term. And so, for example, you know. Uh, I think many of the things that Pratap was saying about the downsides, you know, uh, hopefully were, were very much mm -hmm. part of the, my, my story about, you know, the whole exporting of uh, skills coincides with the deindustrialization. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the whole, you know, the whole uh, accountability mechanism breaking down because there's no stake in the system uh, leading to the secession of the middle class, which, you know, uh, you know, Devesh and I have also written about. Uh, so so, uh, so I, I think that that... Uh, uh, I completely agree with Pratap, but I think you know there is a, 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 a there is a, a description which has positive and and kind of downsides, and I think the fact is that we have to uh, contend with both. Uh, the only question uh, I have for Pratap, um, which is that you know when you end by saying how will we get move away from you know the crony capitalism to rules based capitalism i mean there too i think we tend to think too much in terms of you know or oh, will modi do this or you know or will someone else do that you know or who will sit together and do this i think what i would like to see is much more you know what are the the, the kind of organic or endogenous forces that will lead to that kind of rules based capitalism Will it be a big crisis? Will it be a collapse? You know, will it be, you know, uh, will we avert that because, you know, actually some good things are happening or not? And, and so I think uh, economists, I, I think almost by definition, are not very good at, you know, handling that, you know, how does change happen? Especially how does, you know, kind of fundamental change of, of that sort, you know, moving from uh, the kind of the Gilded Age which, where India is now, to, to, to a more rules-based capitalism. So that, I think, is a, um, e even how to think about this in terms of organic change is, is not very easy. So instead of, Pratap, you get a yeah, chance in a minute, yeah, but um, let me ask a couple of questions for either of you to respond to. Uh, I just came back from Brazil yeah. this morning, and I was there with several colleagues uh, looking at the evolution, among other things, looking at the evolution of the approaches and policies that seem to be associated with really 
substantial reductions in deforestation. And what Arvind just said, this is my first question, about organic and endogenous. What's interesting is there isn't any question <clears throat> that in Brazil there was something that happened after the military government, mm -hmm. which was the NGOs became more and more um, effective, powerful, insistent, adversarial. Then there was a stage where some were less adversarial and more insiders. And just on the issue of deforestation, they were tremendously effective. So my first question is, can you, I mean, I know there's lots and lots of civil society activity in India. The question in my mind has to do with the difference in median income. Yeah. Median income in India now with the new PPP numbers, maybe it's not a dollar. Maybe it's a dollar fifty. Yeah. Median income in Brazil is eight dollars. When the parishes in the UK in the 18th and 19th century started doing a social movement, median income was more like yeah, Brazil, yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah. So that's, let, let, let me leave that with both yeah. of you to, for comment. Why don't we have, do we have any meaningful data to go back to yeah, the evidence yeah, that could be yeah. interpreted in two different yeah, ways yeah. about the role of the bottom-up citizens' movements? And the link to the middle class, which takes me back to some of yeah. what Pratap and I talked about almost a year ago. Yeah. So, so, so there is lots of data. So, you know, if you take proxy, let's say the proliferation of NGOs, just the numbers are, are becoming staggering. Uh, increasingly political involvement. Um, so it's not it's not it's not a disengagement story by any means. And many would argue that what you have seen in the last three or four years is an unprecedented mobilization by civil society around environment. Uh, they're using all kinds of tricks. There's courts, there's all kinds of, but the fact that you could, you know, put a blanket m ban on coal mining for, let's say, two years, right? Uh -huh. um, many are attributing that to, you know, uh, or, or, or using that as an argument to say that that's what caused the downturn in growth. But, but the fact of the matter is, there's enough strength in civil society to basically be able to say to government, look, business as usual cannot continue. Even, the, even the Land Acquisition Act. L Land Acquisition Act. I mean, you, you can take a whole range of legislation. So that's I, not the elite. Is it's, 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 not, it's, it's, it's all, yeah, it's all, it's all it? kinds. It's, it? it's all kinds. I mean, uh -huh. look, I mean, many movements are always elite-led. They have the resources, but, but, it, but it has complicated linkages uh, 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 in, in, in different ways. In my understanding of civil society movements, I mean, I, and, and Kati, I think the interesting question is not their number, their intensity, and their capacity to mobilize. I think the interesting question is whether they, in relation to each other and in relation to government, whether there are structures of negotiation that can meet these competing mm -hmm. conflicts and narratives. Chance. And sometimes these are about ideas. I mean, these are not, we all agree on the objectives. I mean, you know, Indian education, at the end of the day, you know, no matter which way you cut it, right? at the end of the day, Indian education was destroyed by the fact that right? there were two or three very different narratives of how to go about it. And what we've ended up creating is not saying, okay, let A win or B win, at least we'll do A well or B well. What we've ended up doing is elements of A, elements of B, completely at cross purposes, and you get an even more suboptimal outcome. Right? Sort of like healthcare right? in the Health US. <laughs> so, 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 you know, and, and if you think, I mean, this is, this is kind of, kind of not, a, not, a, not a particularly deep point, right? But, but the test of societies is their capacity to intelligently negotiate these differences. Right? Forget even the vested interest. That's the easy part to identify. Right? But what do you do in an education debate when half your educators say, we are not going to test kids because we think the social conditions are such that teachers will use them to keep Dalit children back, therefore no testing. Right? We'll just kind of shunt. I mean, there's a, there's a social fear of that testing. 
The other half says no testing, no accountability. And you can't get them to, you know, join the debate in a constructive way. I think that to me is, and, 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 and I think the role <coughs> economists in this game is to be the honest brokers in that debate. Mm -hmm. So question for Arvind, but you might also want to comment on what Pratap said. So this issue of the deindustrialization or whatever you want to call it, when Pratap said time makes a difference, he captured something very important because we know that this is happening everywhere. And one of Danny's points and one of your own points is that this may just be with globalization and global markets that the all countries are brought along a path that the most advanced economies, which are the most productive in each sector, will be taking. So, you know, agriculture everywhere will become less and less uh, and the, the center of, of G the large proportion of GDP, and services will become more and more. So in the case of Africa, you know, there's all this hype, and a, a good hype, excitement, buzz, about mobile money yeah. and so on. So, you know, I think when you show us the precociousness of India's decline in the manufacturing sector, we want to see if it's more precocious than Latin America, more pre not in not in stock, mm. but in yes. trend. Do you have? And I think you mm. know. So, do you want to say anything about? That? I mean, and how is that? Re maybe it's the right thing mm. for India to be moving quickly into mm. services, which is, after all, where the whole world is going. If you think about this second age of the yeah. machine and all of that, and so it's actually getting ahead, and it's going to be competitive. And, and that's also why we, you have all this uh, foreign direct investment on the good side. Yeah. Not only yeah, capital yeah, yeah. flight, yeah, but India's good so. at this stuff, as well as having English, of course, which helps in so, services, so, especially. So, so I, I think there are um, you know, two, two ways, to, to the two kind of issues here. One is that you know, the, the desirability of doing manufacturing, and, and, and I mean registered manufacturing. I, I don't think no one is going to dispute that because if you look at the numbers, you know, productivity levels, dynamism of, of manufacturing is just way above almost every other sector barring maybe a few sectors. So, so, so the logic well, from- Well, wait, wait. Yeah, I yeah. mean, you could, you could, can you look at regulated services and unregulated mm. services? And might you not mm. say? No, so I'm, I'm, coming, I'm, coming, okay. I'm coming to that. That's, that's the second part of the question. Okay. The second part. So, so, so one is, you know, you have a sector uh, that historically has had a vast ability to absorb low-skilled people. And uh, this is the point that Danny makes, which is also true in India, is that this is actually a very uh, dynamic sector in terms of productivity growth. The tragedy is that there's a lot of product productivity growth that's, that's happening but it's not attracting resources into that sector, which is a bit of a puzzle that you know. So, 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 so the first point is that this is a sector, maybe along with others, where you need resources to flow in, both because there's a nice reallocation effect into high productivity activities, and it's a, dynamically it's also very efficient. So that's point one. But then you could argue the second part is, but well, are there other sectors that fit yeah. this bill? Uh, and as technology changes over time, you know, are there other sectors that fit this bill? Uh, and, and clearly, uh, the answer is there may be. For example, but the point is that we know from India, with, with the experience of those sectors, is that they are highly skilled sectors. So they have not had the ability to employ, you know, this one million people coming into the labor force. So the key question is, so 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 the way I, I see in big terms the choice as the following: Can we find you know, high productive, low skill sec sectors to absorb this one million coming in. Or we just say that we've missed that boat and we actually have to work on the side of enhancing skill capability, you know, acknowledging that one or two cohorts will just be, you know, left behind. And we, um, uh, 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 you know, go gung-ho on the skills, 
because you know that's the way the world is moving. That's the way the technology is moving. And I think, uh, in some ways, I don't think India has actually confronted this challenge mm. in these terms. You know, everyone kind of lazily says we must do manufacturing or we must do services. Uh, but, but I think it's a much more difficult discussion than that. Can, can I, so, it's, it's, it's just the discussion yeah, yeah, in the no, U.S., no, of course, too, yeah. as everybody will have. No, no exactly. But, you know, drawing on, but, but one of the reasons I think it's a hard one to think about, right, is... So one, a lot of people now believe, and there is some evidence, that it's a mistake to think of manufacturing as a low-skill story. Uh, that, I mean, this is an assumption that you know, economists have perpetuated time after time. You talk to any, I mean, why did India lose the boat in textiles, right? I mean, not just because Bangladesh got special preferential treatment, but it is actually a skill and organization story, mm. right? Uh, fact of the matter is you cannot find even middle level floor managers. Manufacturing, I mean, you know, construction, plumbing, these are not, I mean, they're, they're low skill in a, in a certain academic construction of low skill. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the big mistakes has been exactly to construct it as that, right? So many think that the reason we can't pose the dilemma this way is because the low skill manufacturing story is not an option. It's not a low skill story. Anymore, if it ever it's, was. If it ever was. No, but uh, I mean, there I don't know what to, what to think about this because, I mean, the point was that you know when all the Asian tigers started off with with textiles, you know these were not you know super uh, you know uh, 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 educated super uh, things. Even Bangladesh, not. I, I think so. So. But they had. They had this okay. middle level. Yeah. yeah. No, no, but, but but I mean, I would say no. But, See, because I think one has to distinguish that from you know. We'll get to you. Uh, 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 <laughs> because part of the manufacturing story is also all the things that we did that militated against becoming big in India. Uh, you know, uh, and not just labor yeah. laws. I think there was just a conspiracy against becoming big. Uh, and so that's why we, I mean, to me, the notion that we don't have managers like Bangladesh had, I mean, that you would have to, you would have to, you know, I, I, I mean, look at any comparative, in, you know, study of the textile industry. Textile is a really good example. Right. I mean, partly because in Bangladesh that was the one sector. So, all, so the small pool you have goes in that sector. But the second thing that has changed, right, which is, and why these historical comparisons are a bit fraught. The good thing about the world right now is almost no country is in a position to take geostrategic advantage. Remember, the world in 1945, 1950, 1960, right? Colonialism was the big geostrategic advantage, right? Uh, Michael Moore made this joke, right? We were, America was good at manufacturing cars until there was no competition, right? And then, right? The fact is that the reason now the, the structure of the game has changed is everybody is in the game. Africa is a candidate. Mm -hmm. East Asia was in that sense slightly different. I mean, there was a geostrategic structure. There were manufacturing cycles. I mean, which is why the single variable story, right? Well, they did it this way. As Hirschman always said, mechanism, mechanism, mechanism. You know, complete the full circle. Your linkages. And that's, that's changed. Okay, let's go and hear a couple of comments, questions from those of you out there for either Arvind or Pratap. So, mic up here. Um, Jen, thanks. Question for Arvind. I think we want the mic because we're, um, it'll be available on YouTube or something. Question for Arvind, and I think it's, uh, it has to do with this contextualization issue. I was struck by the chart on uh, Latinization of India, I think something which we're beginning to see in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa also. And I was struck also by the timeline where uh, inflation started to pick up round about when the global liquidity glut started in the late 80, in the late 2000s and you started seeing a lot of capital in search of, uh, you know, in search of yield basically. So I was wondering to what extent it was basically push factors mm -hmm. uh, and the ease of financing uh, that tempted in a way kind of the government to, to uh, I mean, uh, ease of access to financing internationally that allowed higher fiscal deficits to be pursued in India. Uh, Re remind, introduce yourself so sorry, we all uh, know that you're asking I'm about Ramos Lassi from the IMF. Because he's from the IMF. <laughs> yes, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so, but keep so, them short yeah. so we can have... So, so uh, I mean, it's a good question, but remember, uh, the point is that in that period, 
global inflation took off, uh, which has happened before, but, but, the, but the point was that in India, it, it, global inflation took off much more than elsewhere, uh, which has never happened before. Uh, so, so, so that to me is, is the puzzle of, of, of the Indian, uh, uh, you know, that India having lost its historical record on, you know, Victorian virtue of sound money and fiscal prudence and all of that. So, so, so it's, not a, it's not that, you know, in absolute terms, India's inflation went off, but it went off relative to the rest of the world in a way that never happened before. <coughs> Um, well, the thing is that so so that's uh, that's p- certainly part of the story. But remember, uh, the world became financially globalized as well. So it wasn't peculiar to India that you know this globalization. A- and also remember that in India's first crisis in ninety one, that was also a story where we spent a lot and we didn't get foreign private flows, but we we borrowed a lot in that instance, uh, and that's what happened. So, 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 so the bottom line is that, yes, financial globalization, easy access to credit uh, explains part of the story, but to me it still doesn't answer why India, with common world conditions, did much worse than anyone else, given its own record of being much better than everyone else uh, in history. Yeah, it's all, the Latinization, I mean... Your it, inflation never got above fifteen percent or ten percent in India. So all of this is differences around. I mean, in in, in Latin America, inflation. It's very high. Oh my goodness. So anyway, um, so I wouldn't press too hard on that particular. Is that Todd? Yeah. Introduce yourself, Todd. I'm Todd Moss here at the center. Um, Arvin, I'm still not satisfied on the services discussion. I I like the genes, geography, and geology um, uh, uh, framework. But if we think about uh, Nigeria, Mm -hmm. um, and the reason I'm so enthusiastic about your Understanding India initiative is only in a little bit about India itself and more about what we could learn from India for places like, uh, like West Africa. So Nigeria, we think of it as an oil economy, but the oil, it's growing at 6 to 8%. The oil sector is shrinking at the same time. And basically, you have people coming from the countryside from very low productivity agriculture into the cities and doing low productivity services. And then you also have high, some high-skill services growing. The prospects for Nigeria to become a manufacturing uh, a giant are close to zero, at least for the next 30 years. Uh, so where... Where you know where does that leave a place like Nigeria and trying to learn from India about how do you make that agriculture to uh, to services leap uh, and do it in a way that actually generates jobs that doesn't generate lots of political unrest. So, so, so uh, um, um, uh, Todd, you know, in some ways you're you're forcing me into you know, in a sense forecasting the future and picking kind of potential winners in terms of particular sectors. You know, gene, mm-hmm. genes, geology, and geography is kind of a little bit retrospective uh, mm-hmm. analysis. And, and I think, so, so I think to translate that into policy terms, I mean, I think the only way policymakers can po- potentially respond to that is the levers they control are not which sectors they will go into. The levers they can control are, you know, is this going to be required particular sets of skills, for example, and you know, and so work on, on on that side to be prepared for, because we know that the way it's going to happen is some technology coming along. You know, the, even the Indian skills story is is part accident, right? Part historical accident that we had the English, we had this skill power for completely extraneous reasons, and then the IT revolution happened, which India took advantage of along with this reputational thing. So, so in some ways. You know, for policymakers, I don't think that is a, a, a really a, a question that uh, because it's it's more like crystal gazing. I would say more in this economy where technology is changing, where manufacturing is more difficult to do. What should policymakers do to kind of be prepared for the next thing that comes along? Okay. Arvind, mm-hmm. has there been any country in the world mm-hmm. that has grown in a sustained, balanced way without industrial policy, including the United States of America? Oh, the U.S. has had. Magnificent industry. Exactly, policy. exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, 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 so when economists say, you know, there's some just general set of skills, there are no, no, no choices to make. See, but, but the point is that, you know, uh, 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 
among among the, the the policy variables that governments can <coughs> deploy, I mean, there are a whole bunch of things. You know, it can be skills, it can be R and D help, yeah. depending yeah. on this. Yeah. It can be industrial policy. But the question is that, you know, uh, there have been cases of good industrial policy, there have been cases of bad exactly. industrial policy. So uh, as a policymaker, you know, after all, India has had industrial policy. I mean, it's just that turned out to be led to deindustrialization rather than industrialization. So so, so if, if you were to ask me what industrial policy to follow for India or for Nigeria, I mean, right. I wouldn't know what right. to say. But do we have data from India on productivity in what you refer to, I'm not sure it was in this presentation, regulated or let's say formal services compared to informal services. I, is it possible that we are all underestimating, understating the increase in both the formal and the informal service sectors in productivity, which would be the only way to explain yeah, yeah. all this growth so, so, in, so, so Nancy, not in Nigeria, but in the non-oil mm -hmm. states in Africa and in parts of India that have, they don't have genes, they don't have geography, they have a lot of informality, and they're growing. Mm -hmm. so, so, so Nancy, see, part of the, remember the part of the problem uh, is that, you know, there is no such thing as services. I mean, there are like hundreds of different kinds of services and hundreds of different kinds of formal services and hundreds of, kind of informal services. So I think part of it is just the fact that you don't have the data to analyze it is, is what, you know, and that's no excuse for economists. But what we do know, of course, is that there are some parts of services which we know have been grown gangbusters in terms of technology, like the whole IT and telecommunication yeah. sector. But, 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 but then, you know, can you say, you know, I want all of India to move into right. the IT sector or all of India to move into the tech, tech sector, you know. Uh, it's not a, a kind of easy thing to, to kind of prescribe. Yeah, that's tough. So, uh, questions? Yes, please, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm uh, Ramakrishna from uh, USAID. Uh, one of the things that uh, is striking about India when we look at uh, the disparity, you alluded to the disparity of uh, development, and there is, uh, you know, there is a lot of numbers uh, that we can be show. One of them f uh, that I worry about is the Electrification, for example, uh, even after 50 years of uh, industrialization and building of power plants, etc., we still have more than 300 million people without access to electricity in India. 80, 90 percent of them are rural. So this uh, kind of thing permeates in education in every other sector that you can think of. I was wondering what kind of answers that India could have for making it more equitable. This development and growth that you talk about. And you know, you also mentioned the fact that there is the growth of this NGO sector, the three million NGOs or so in India. But somehow, I, what I feel is that there may be you know tremendous number of nodes, but there's no network that uh, mm. these are, uh, are forming to make you know social change, especially for the, you know, the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, so, what kind of solutions could be there going forward? <laughs> electricity. <laughs> you do electricity, and you do oh, all the okay. rest. Yeah. <laughs> You know, uh, I, I mean, the, the, you know, the, the power problem in India is, uh, is you know, I, 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 I kind of uh, sometimes say that, you know, if we can crack power, yeah. I, I, I think we, we kind of crack a lot of, you know, mm -hmm. what's wrong with India, both in a growth sense and in an equity sense. And as you well know, there are, you know, there's the whole, you know, institutional capacity side that Pratap has spoken about, which, you know, I, I know less about. Um, and then we know, for example, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's a whole, you know, these big companies are involved in, in the banking. They were over indebted, not being able to, I think. But then there's the, there's the big part, which is something that I know just a little about, which is that, you know, if you have to get into what Pratap calls rule-based capitalism in this sector, I mean, we need to be able to get people to pay for power. I mean, you know, that basic thing that, you know, but we don't have a social consensus around, you know, paying for power. You know, in some states, making some advances. But in most states, you know, if, if you recall, when the Aam Army Party came into power with all this promise, the first thing that they said was, we continue cheap power and cheap water. And in the aftermath, 
two BJP states that said, yes, we're also going to give uh, cheap power. So unless that political problem of, you know, the basic social contract around, you know, everyone pays power, power is solved, I don't think we can crack this in a kind of sustainable basis. I know we can, you know, we can build more power generation. We can, you know, unbundle and uh, and uh, privatize distribution. But fundamentally, unless we get some sort of, and you see, remember, there's a chicken and egg problem here. That we know that if you can deliver, you know, uninterrupted power, people are willing to pay for power. You know, they're willing to pay for power, but they they won't say we'll pay and wait for you to deliver because the state doesn't have credibility on that. So it is a kind of chicken and egg problem. And here too, what I feel is the way forward is for, you know, good experiments to work in some parts of India and for them to travel elsewhere. And, and you know, apart from that, I'm not sure how it's going to. Mm -hmm. And it, it's related to the perverse yeah. views, confusion about redistribution, mm -hmm. that you redistribute through cheap, power to and the poor yeah. when in fact it's the opposite of course so. yeah no, 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 i think that's it. So, so part of it is i mean you know I, I think if you if you actually read the debates over energy in india right i think there is an issue about kind of what is our strategy what are our objectives i mean i mean energy policy we've messed up big time a we need a ministry of energy we don't need six different ministries you know of, of, of different kinds uh, it's been easy for governments to take the 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 easy way out uh, there are transition paths, right? I mean, you know, forget things like getting people to pay. Most states would not even do a distinction between peak power pricing and low low power. I mean, that you know, right? I mean, it's 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 just kind of there's a construction around how prices work. I think part of the challenge, I think, and 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 and, and I think this is where you should see this kind of this revolt against power prices because it answers your NGO question as well. Right. Is I am actually less down on the Aam Aadmi Party than Arvind is for raising the power issue. This is the, right? the, the Delhi the, the, party. The, the Delhi party which said, said it's well, going to cut, right? Yeah. Because politically what they were doing was not just politically but institutionally very clever. And, and I, think, I think it's a question of kind of all the guys on the, with the right heart are on the sort of wrong side. But you are going to convince people to pay, right? if you don't think the power companies are charging exorbitant rents. This is what you would ha expect to happen in a democracy. It happened in Brazil, right? If you don't have transparent costing, at some point it is going to come and haunt you, right? So the proper response to that party was not to say you are being populist. The proper response would have been, which is how it should have been in a democracy, let us get some transparent costing on this. Unfortunately, all the reformers actually did not join that conversation, right? The water thing that they were promising, and you know, just to give you a sense of what's, the headline across the world, Indian elite newspapers was, Aam Aadmi Party promising cheap water, okay? What they completely missed was the brilliance of what they were doing, which was they were saying, you get X amount of free water. After that, if you consume more than that, you have to pay for the whole thing. What would that have that, that, that done? That would have required the metering of Delhi's water for mm. the first time. Mm. Now, the debate in India, unfortunately, that the reformers in India are the biggest enemies of reform. Because there's such a stratospheric kind of rhetorical, you know, way in which we say these are the bad guys, these are the good guys. Mm -hmm. You have to think dynamically and dialectically, mm -hmm. right? Um, I mean, I'm, I, I, when I'm saying this, is reformers have done more harm to the cause of reform in India than the NGOs have done. <laughs> I think that is a brilliant close to a, a brilliant discussion. Thank you, Arvind. Thank you, Pratap. Thank you. Could we all join in?